Let's open with prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we love You. We give You honor. And the purpose of our learning is to know more about You and Your ways and Your ways of doing things and to study what You told us in Your Word. Because we understand if You didn't want us to know, You wouldn't have told us. So we need to study what You say, what You said. Bring it deep into our hearts. We love you, Father. In the name of Jesus, amen. All right. Well, we are going to start with session three, but one thing that I want to mention at the very end of session two that we didn't mention is a great sign of the end times. One of the greatest signs of the end times is Daniel says in chapter 12, verse 4, but you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. We are approaching the time of the end. Many will run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. Let's take just a few seconds and review how knowledge has increased. From the time of Adam until the time of Abraham, people traveled by foot, and by the fastest animal they could find. From the time of Abraham to the time of King David, people traveled by foot or by the fastest animal that they could find. From the time of King David up until Jesus, at the time of Jesus, except for when Jesus just appeared places, people traveled by foot or by the fastest animal they could find. And all the way up until now, let's say up until the time my grandmother was born in Climax Springs, Missouri, people traveled by foot or by the fastest animal that they could find. My grandmother was a, a sweet lady. Her name was Allie. She was born in Climax Springs, Missouri. And she told me one day, that she remembered at the age of 13 seeing her very first automobile. But within months of when my grandmother passed, people were watching astronauts walk on the moon, traveling at tens of thousands of miles per hour to get there. So, I believe when the Word of God says, at the time of the end, knowledge shall increase, and people shall go to and fro, that's telling us that for 6,000 years, people traveled by horse, by camel, by elephant, whatever they could find. But within one generation, from the time my grandmother was born until the time she died, not only did they invent the automobile, but they had spacecraft. I would say we are in the end times that was talked about in the time of Daniel, where knowledge greatly increased. We will now start with session three. Eternity passed. We need to understand that the Scripture tells us that Lucifer was created. In Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 12 to 15, it says, Thus says the Lord God, and he's talking to Lucifer, you were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden. Now you need to understand here that Lucifer was in a place called Eden. Does that ring familiar with anyone? The garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. The sardis, the topaz, Diamond, beryl, onyx, jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. Now here's one thing we need to understand about Lucifer. He was perfect. God created him perfect. I have six grandchildren, and over the years, every grandchild has asked me this question. They've sat in church, they've sat in children's church, and finally they came to the big question. Grandpa, why did God make the devil? Well, the answer is quite simple. He didn't create the devil. He created Lucifer. 
And Lucifer, when he was created, was perfect. We know that he was not always in existence. Understand this, the day before Lucifer was created, he didn't exist. There was a day when God created Lucifer, but the day before Lucifer was created, he did not exist. But the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit did. Now, look at verse 14. You were the anointed cherub who covers. Uh, what is cherub? Well, that's one. That's an angel. That, that's a specific position in the kingdom of God. A cherubim. Have you heard the word cherubim? That's plural for cherub. You were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You, whack, you walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. That's gemstones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created. Until iniquity was found in you. We think that we are the only creation that had a choice. But the reality is, is God created angels with a choice. Now how do we know that? Because some of them chose poorly. And they suffered from their lack of choosing correctly. See, angels were created, as we touched on last night in our last session, they were created with a purpose. Let's take a look at the purpose of angels. They were created to be servants. Now we need to know this. God refers to mankind as His children. He never refers to angels as His children. In 1 John 3, 1, it says, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God. Angels are not the children of God. You may say, why are we taking so much time on angels? Angels are an integral part of our past, but they're an integral part of the future of the prophetic plan of God. You will find all the way throughout eternity future. Now, they were not always in eternity past, but eternity future has angels in it. And there are so many people who do not understand the concept that angels are a different creation than mankind. Angels never become man. Man never becomes angels. We have separate promises, separate purposes, and separate destinies. And any religion that says that man becomes an angel, or that God is an angel, or that Jesus is an angel, it's a heresy. Because as men on this earth, as mankind on this earth, we who believe in Jesus, we are the children of God. And God's offspring are offspring of His kind. We were created, now I know this bothers some people, but it's just too bad. It's scriptural. We were created, man was created in the God class of creation. Now, we are not God. We are not going to become God. God the Father is our Father. But we are His children. And that puts us in the God family. And for all eternity, the church, specifically the church, has privileges that the rest of the creation of the universe does not have. Because we are children of the King. And we rule and reign as kings and priests. And angels do not. You can find where there are angelic beings who have dominion over certain areas. There are principalities and powers. But everything has been placed under His feet. And how many of you know that as His feet, we are a part of His body? That means everything's placed under us. Wow. The first purpose of angels, 
in their creation was to worship God. Hebrews 1.6 says, But when He again brings the firstborn into the world, He says, Let all the angels of God worship Him. All the angels of God are to worship Jesus. Now their second purpose, the second purpose of angels is to carry out the will of God. In Psalm 103, verses 20 and 21, this is a pivotal scripture in understanding angels. It says, Bless the Lord, you His angels, who excel in strength. Now, it doesn't say that their strength is limitless, but they excel in strength. Now, here's what angels do. Who do His Word. Angels do the Word of God. Now, here's, a, here's another key. Heeding. Now, when we come to this word heeding, you must understand there's a huge difference between heeding and hearing. How many of you have children? There are times when your children hear what you say, right? There's times when they hear what you say. And then there's times when they heed what you say. Hearing means sometimes it went in one ear and out the other. Heeding means it went in one ear and it stuck. And they actually did what you told them to do. So this tells us that angels, when they do His Word, they heed it. In other words, they put action to it. Bless the Lord, all you His hosts, you ministers of His, who do His pleasures. See, listen to this. You are the voice of His Word on the earth today. Now, simplistic put, the Father is in heaven. We discussed that earlier. The Father is in heaven. And Jesus is in heaven. Now, here's a novel concept. Jesus said He was going. I learned this in physics class. And He went there. Here's a great physics problem for you. Since He is there, that means He is not here. Y'all got that? All right. So, He went to be with the Father. The Father is in heaven. So He and the Father are in heaven. Now, now listen to me. You say, but I know that Jesus is here on the earth with me right now. By His Spirit, He is. Remember earlier we said you could not understand Scripture, end-time prophecy, without understanding that man is a three-part being. And you need to understand also in that we said that God is a three-part being. So the Father is in heaven. Jesus said, He told His disciples in John 14, He said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in Me. In My Father's house, there are many mansions, there are many rooms, and I'm going to go and prepare a place for you. That's what he said. And you know what he eventually did? He left to prepare a place for us in his father's house. And then he said, and if I go, I'm going to come back and get you so that where I am, there you can be also. Now when he comes back to get us, that's what we call the rapture. We'll study that in detail in just a little bit. But he's coming back to get us. Okay, now, now follow me through on this. He left... And he's coming back. He's already left, but he hasn't come back yet. So that means he's not here. I know that sounds simplistic, but most Christians don't get that. So the Father and the Son are in a place called heaven, but the Holy Spirit, who is God, is here on the earth living in each one of us who are born-again believers. And this is why there's been, over the years, especially in these end times, there has been such a great battle against the Holy Spirit. I mean, there are actually church denominations that teach that the things of the Holy Spirit are totally irrelevant. The gifts of the Spirit are irrelevant. Just live a good life and be happy. No, 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 no. Let me tell you something. The power of God 
is indwelled in the Holy Spirit here on this earth. In Acts 1.8, Jesus, one of the last things he said before he ascended was this. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. He's telling this new entity called the church that's only been on the earth 40 days. He's telling this new entity, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit is coming upon you. Now, here's the thing. Your words are extremely important. Because with your words, you bless. With your words, you curse. In these end times especially, we must understand that life and death, death and life, are in the power of the tongue. Your life and your death are in the power of your tongue. And with your mouth, you can be the voice of the Word of God on this earth. Do angels follow you around at your command? Now, this, this is kind of a touchy area with some people. We understand that angels are here to minister to us. And they are on the earth to minister for us. But the reality is, they only heed the voice of the Word of God. Are you following me? According to Scripture, they heed the voice of the Word of God. But here's, here's the good news. You control the voice of the Word of God on this earth. So, you, as long as you speak the Word of God, then the angels of God are set up in their system to where they enact, they heed and act on the Word of God that you speak. They do not act on anything else. So when you say, I'm sick, I'm broke, I'm poor, nothing goes right in my life, everybody else, oh, they got the Midas touch, everything they touch turns to, to gold, everything I touch turns to, you know, stuff that's in the, the kitty litter box, you know. I, I, some people put money in their pocket and it expands, I got a hole in my pocket. You know what the angels of God are doing when you say that? They're setting back. saying, my goodness, my goodness, if he would speak the Word of God or if she would speak God's Word, we could do something to help them out of that. But they're not. The angels only heed the voice of the Word of God. That is great news. Now, what, what is the purpose of man? He created man in his image and in his likeness. As we discussed in our last session, He created us to look like Him, and He created us to act like Him. We are supposed to imitate God. Ephesians 5.1 says, Therefore, be imitators of God. This is a New Testament Scripture written to the New Testament church. Christians. Remember, there's Jews, Gentiles, and Christians on the earth right now. This is written to Christians. We are commanded to imitate God. Who should we act like? We should act like God. Well, how do you act like God? You do what God would do in a situation. You say what God would say in a situation. Well, how do I know what God says? Well, Forrest, let me explain it to you. This is God's statement of faith. This is His Word. You want to know what God says? Just read the Word of God. Sometimes people say, well, you just, you just never know what God's going to do. Well, and sometimes, you know, you can't help but think, you idiot. <laughs> what do you mean you don't know? You could know if you would just check out what God said. Read the transcript of what He said. You know, they do that in a trial. They say, we need to review this transcript of what this person said. Well, just here's the transcript of what God says. All right. So we are to imitate God. God intends for us to be the inheritors of the blessing. Romans chapter 8, verses 14 to 17 says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the what? The sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, 
Abba, stepfather. Abba, friend. Abba, Daba, do. No. We cry out, Abba, Father. He is our Father. Now let me tell you something. My dad passed away uh, just about a year ago, and I miss him. But when I was a, a young boy, there were times when I didn't miss him. Especially when he would come around the corner and correct me in that loving way that my dad corrected me. <laughs> okay, now I don't miss him anymore. I'm thinking here. <laughs> but no, I do. I miss my dad. I love my dad. But even though my dad took times to correct me, and the Bible says that those whom he loves, talking about God, says those whom he loves, he reproves and disciplines. So God disciplines us. My dad disciplined me. But let somebody else try to come against me. Let somebody else try to hurt me. And the full wrath of my dad would come down upon them. Because although he disciplined me, he loved me. And he protected me. Well, this is the way God is with us. Yes, there may be times of discipline. But we are the ones who call him Abba Father. We are the ones who receive His blessing. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. That's powerful. Joint heirs with Christ. See, God... Wants us to understand that He loves us. And God's plan is a good plan. Now, as born again people, as faith people, we teach that we shouldn't just say, well, God's will be done, whatever God wants. I understand that. There are times. Uh, when we should know how to pray, we should know His will, and we should speak His will. But let me tell you something. When all the dust settles, God's will for you is good. See, James 1.17 says, every good and every perfect gift comes down from the Father, in whom there's no variation or shadow of turning. God is the giver of good gifts. A very well-known minister who is passed away. He was the father of, in the faith to a, a lot of us. Years ago, back in the 60s, he preached a sermon and started teaching about how God was a good God and the devil was a bad devil. And a lot of people got upset. sad thing is, the people that got upset were preachers. Because there's a lot of people that taught that some of these bad things that happened to you, it's God. You know, God put that sickness on you to teach you something. No, you don't, you don't teach your children by hurting them. You don't take them out to Interstate 44 and say, today, we're going to teach you why you should not play in the road. Now, and just wait till a semi comes. And we're just going to give you a lesson today and push them out there. No, you don't do that. You may train your children, and sometimes discipline doesn't seem all of that good. But the reality is, is God never wants to hurt us. And His plan for you is a good plan. We need to understand that. Now, back to angels. Lucifer had free will. He had a choice. In Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 to 14, it says, How you have are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. My goodness, isn't that interesting? Man was not created yet. And somehow, 
Lucifer weakened the nations. This tells us clearly, whether we want to admit it or believe it or not, there was a creation of some sort before man. Angelic, possibly, possibly not. But we know that there were nations before the creation of man. What were these nations like? I don't really know. But in order to have a nation, you have to have weaponry, currency, trading ability, territory. And we know that Lucifer did something to weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also, he didn't say instead of, he said, I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. See, he didn't necessarily say he was going to replace God. He said, I'm going to be like God. I'm going to put my throne on the sides of the north with his. And I'm going to be like the God Most High. Well, here's, here's the big problem in all this. He wasn't created to be like God. God had a plan for a creation that was going to be like him. It was going to be in his image and his likeness. But the angels weren't it. And when they decided to step outside of their realm of their creation is when Lucifer was cast down. Now, it says here in Colossians 1.12, giving thanks. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. We have been qualified. And because the devil stepped outside his realm, Lucifer, he became disqualified. The Bible tells us that pride goes before a fall. And that is so evident with Satan. His pride and his fall. Look at what Jesus said in Luke 10, 18. He said, I saw Satan fall from lightning. Fall like lightning from heaven. I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Well, this tells us several things. One, Satan was in heaven. He was in heaven. Jesus was there when he fell. Because Jesus saw it. Man had not been created yet. Thus, we can prove by that scripture, Jesus was in existence before man. Of course, we know that because John 1.1 1, 1 tells us that he created man. It tells us how fast Satan fell. pa -ching. <laughs> it wasn't like a struggle like you see in some of the paintings you know and he finally God finally gets him down no it's like like lightning and he fell to the earth oh my goodness see he came out of heaven once again Isaiah 14 12 says how you are fallen from heaven O Lucifer Ezekiel 28 15 and 17 we read that earlier but let's take another look here. It says, you were perfect, Ezekiel 28, 15, and 16. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you by the abundance of your trading. Now, did you pick it up a few moments ago when we said that he was cast down before the nations that he weakened? By the abundance of of your trading. Somehow, he was involved in commerce. By the abundance of your training, you became filled with violence. Now listen to this. He became filled with violence. That lets us know he wasn't created that way. How do we know God created him perfect? Because he became, through the inequity of his trading, he became filled with violence, 
within. And you sinned. Therefore, I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God, and I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. Wow, that's powerful, isn't it? See, Lucifer was never intended to be an heir. 1 Peter 1.12 says, To them it was revealed that, not to themselves, but to us, You see this? To them it was revealed that, not to themselves, but to us, they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the Gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven things which angels desire to look into. There are things that are being preached to us that angels desire to understand. But because they are not created in the God class, they don't get it. They desire to, but they just don't get it. Have you ever talked to somebody that just didn't get it? Well, seriously, there are certain things you can train a dog to do, but you can't train a dog to fill out your income tax. Although I think I met that tax man once. <laughs> but but the, you know what I'm saying. I say that in love. In case my tax man is watching this, I, I say that in love. <laughs> but, but the reality is this. There are some things beyond the comprehension of the class you were created in. You can teach a dog some things, but there's some things you can't teach them, and no matter how you try, the dog will never grasp it because it's beyond the comprehension of the class they were created in. There are some things. See, angels don't necessarily understand everything. Because they were not created in the class that understands everything. Why is it we have such great revelation? Why is it we can be taught by the Holy Spirit Himself? Because we're created in the image and likeness of God. With the, our spirits have the capacity to understand the deep things of God. Why is it the devil so stupid? You see, if he had a half a brain, he doesn't have half a brain. You know, I've often thought when I was a kid, I used to think, my goodness, if I was a devil, I'd repent. <laughs> I told my pastor that one time, Josie Porter, pastor of Spring Valley Baptist Church in Raytown, Missouri. I was a little kid and I said, you know, why doesn't the devil just give up? I mean, if he could read the end of the book, he could see that he loses. If he just keeps doing what he's doing, he's going to end up in hell. So, you know, if I was a devil, I would just say, God, I repent. And Brother Porter said to me, he said, well, he said, you know, if he repents, he still gets the judgment because it's prophesied. I said, I know that may be true. But if I was the devil, I would throw myself on the mercy of the court. And I would say, look, you can send me to the bottomless pit. You can put me in Hades, in outer darkness, whatever you want. But when you send me, I'm going to be worshiping you and I'm going to be loving you. And from this point on, I'm yours. I Granted, I deserve everything I'm going to get, but I love you and I worship you. And just hope that God would add an extra page at the end <laughs> that says, and after a billion years, I released him. <laughs> but the devil can't do that because he's too stupid. You know, you need to understand this. You rule and reign as children of a God who knows everything over a devil who knows very little. And he's not smart enough to repent. Alright? Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy. We all know that scripture, John 10.10. 10. For those of you who are older, 
you can remember that scripture easily. Just think about Ren 10.10. But John 10.10 says, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. This scripture, I believe, is the mission statement of the Bible. It's the mission statement of God and the mission statement of the devil. This scripture gives both mission statements. The thief, referring to the enemy, comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus came to give his life. Hmm. Boy, that is so good. Lucifer's heart was prideful. Ezekiel 28, 17 says, Your heart was lifted up. That Hebrew word there means prideful. Because of your beauty, God created him beautiful. Because of your beauty, you corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I Look at this. I laid you before who? Okay. Didn't we say earlier that he had deceived the nations? Didn't we see earlier in another scripture where because of his inequity of trading? And here we say, we see where it says, when he cast him down, he cast him down before kings. So there must have been nations, there were nations because the scripture tells us so, and these nations evidently had kings that they might gaze at you. Whoever these kings were, we know one thing. They had a kingdom and they had eyeballs. All right. See, you go with what you know. They could see. All right. Bottom line is, man was created to inherit salvation. Angels were not. And once again, that's Hebrews 1.14. Now, something that we need to understand is that the Bible gives a concept, and when I teach young children, I like for them to understand this. The Bible gives a, a solid concept that if you hang out with an idiot, you'll become an idiot. Well, I think it says it a little more gracious than that. It says, the company of fools will make you a fool. Well, there were angels who hung out with Lucifer. Satan conned. He wasn't a con man. We just put it this way. He was a con angel. He conned one third of the angels to believe that they would be better off following him than staying with God. See, Proverbs 13, 20 gives us this scripture. It says, he who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools will be destroyed. One third of the heavenly host followed the lie of Lucifer that he could somehow be like God. Now, just because they followed him, you would think that they would get less punishment. But evidently, the laws of heaven are kind of like the laws of the state of Missouri that we're in here. I know of a, a man, personally, I know this man, who 20, 25 years ago was in an automobile. He was, as they say in the movies, he was the getaway man. He was in the automobile while a couple of his friends went into a convenience store to rob it. While they were in the convenience store robbing it, the clerk got killed. They came back out. They got away. They got caught. They all got life. This man is in prison to this day. This church was founded 21 years ago that we're sitting in right now. On the day this church was founded, he was in prison. He is in prison today. And according to the law, he will be for life. But he didn't even go in the store. No. But he got the same punishment as his friends who did. See, what you're going to find through Scripture, all of the angels who followed Lucifer are going to receive the same punishment that he got. He was the instigator, but they all received the punishment. Jesus even made the comment, and it's quoted in Scripture, that says, hell was not created for man, but for the devil and his angels. All right? 
Jesus in John 8, 44, he was talking to the Pharisees and he said, he said, listen, guys, you're just like your father, Satan. He's a murderer. He's a liar. Always has been. Always will be. In fact, when he speaks, he speaks out of his own resources. For he's a, li a liar. And, and he goes on to say, he's the father of lies. Well, he's had a lot of practice. And evidently, this almost sounds like an oxymoron, but he, he's a good liar. He's proficient at it, let's put it that way. Enough so that he convinced one-third of the heavenly host who had been with God for we don't know how long, eons of time, seeing the goodness of God, but somehow, because of the pride, it tells us, that came up within Lucifer, because of his splendor, because of his good looks. Have you ever met somebody that had a little bit of pride because of their good looks? Now, I mean, of course, there's people like me who have good looks and humility. Ah, <laughs> oh, that was a joke. I could tell by the way you all laughed. I, I often joked about, uh, for years, Harrison House has asked me, what, what book I'm going to do next? Every time we do a book, they say, what, what are you planning on next? And I like to tell them that I'm thinking about a book on humility. I'd like to have my picture on the front. Not looking up, but looking down at everyone else. And we could, we could title the book, Humility and How I Obtained It. Or possibly, if you work hard enough, you can be like me. You know? <laughs> but, but the reality is, that's the way the devil thought. And he wasn't joking about it. He was serious. He, he had serious problems. Well, the devil is going to suffer, and has already suffered, the consequences of his choices. And so will mankind. The devil, I believe, and all of the fallen angels still have choice. But they've also been judged already. And once they've been judged and sentenced, there's really no changing. You might say that, uh, once again, this is a question my grandkids ask me. Well, if the devil's been defeated, like the Bible says, like we sing in children's church, then how come we still have problems with him? Well, it's because he has been defeated, but he is on death row, so to speak. And right now, he's just hanging out on death row, waiting for his sentence to be fully complete. And while he's here on earth, we've been given authority over him. You might say, we're the jail keeper. He's on death row. We, we may be on the earth. But he has no authority over us. We have all authority over him. All right? So we are responsible for our choices. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Let's, um, I'm going to pass over this for just a little bit, but we need to understand that faith is something that was the ability to have faith was given to us by God. And faith is simply believing God. It's the substance of things hoped for. I think I do have to mention this one thing about hope. Growing up a Southern Baptist and then moving into this realm of believing things outside of the Southern Baptist realm, I moved into a starting to fellowship with a bunch of people who call themselves faith people. This is back in the 70s. Back in the 70s, we had a lot of faith people. We had a lot of crazy faith people. And we had some people who really believed the Word of God, but they believed it so strongly that they lived their lives correcting other people. 
You couldn't hardly carry on a conversation sometimes without them. That's not faith. You say, well, I just, that's not faith. <laughs> you know. And, um, you know, we're not supposed to be the faith police of other people. We need to watch our mouths. Take care of our mouths. And you can train other people without criticizing them. But one of the things that always um, I was criticized for a lot was I would say, you know, I'm really hoping that, and every time, I wouldn't get the rest of the sentence out. And it was like, hope, hope, you're hoping, wishing and hoping, you're just wishing and hoping. Wishing and hoping never got you anywhere. It's only faith. Well, you know, there's some truth in this. But Paul said that we should never give up our confession of hope. Now, hope is the intent expectation that what God has promised will come to pass. That's that intent expectation. If God says, let's just take healing. If God says that He will heal us and He is the healer, hope is that intent expectation that someday God is going to fulfill that promise and I will be healed. It is on its way. I'm believing healing is coming my way. That's hope. Faith believes that it's already happened. Faith says, by the stripes of Jesus, I have been healed. And if I have been, I am and I'm not waiting for healing. I'm not the sick wanting to get healed. I am the healed with symptoms of sickness. Healing is not going to be mine. Healing is mine. That's faith. But out of the abundance, Jesus gave us a very clear message here. He said, out of the abundance of the heart, your mouth speaks. And he said, if you say to that mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and you believe in your heart, not your head. You believe in your heart that those things you say will come to pass. Then you will have what you say. So the key is getting faith in your heart. How do you get faith in your heart? Romans 10, 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But when you first hear it, it's not in your heart, it's in your head. And if you have faith in your head and you're led by your head, you'll be a lead head because nothing's ever going to, nothing's ever going to work out <laughs> out of your head. It's all what's in your heart. So out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth speaks. If, if that takes place, then that's faith and it comes to pass. Now that takes us back to hope. So people say, well, then if hope is not what activates the power of God, which it's not. Faith is what activates the power of God. There's two spiritual forces in the spirit realm. One is the force of light. One is the force of darkness. In the Hebrew language, uh, for those of you who don't know, my wife teaches Hebrew, but I knew this before I met my wife. Okay. Just trying to tell you how smart I am. Uh, <laughs> but the reality is, is, I was taught years ago that the opposite of faith in the Hebrew language is fear. Now, in the English language, we have opposites. If I were to say, and I wanted you to give me the opposite, hot, east, north, up. See, you automatically know what those opposites are. You didn't have to think about it. It's, it's in your heart. You already know. I can't convince you any differently. It's, it's already in your heart. But when you say faith, it's kind of like, uh, well, it's fear. And somehow, translating from Hebrew into English in our Bibles, it just doesn't quite come across that way. Well, you cannot be doing opposites at the same time. Uh, in, uh, I've had several airplanes over the years, and there's been gauges in the dash, and one of the gauges was rate of ascent, and one is rate of, and it's, and rate of descent. Now, they only had one gauge. Why didn't I have a gauge that was rate of ascent and a different gauge that was rate of descent? You only need one because you can only be doing one at a time. Let's put it this way. If the plane's going up, it's not going down. 
And if it's going down, it's not going up. Why? Up and down are opposites. You cannot be doing both at the same time. Water's hot or it's cold. You're facing east or you're facing west. You're either in faith or you're in fear. So, with this in mind, the spiritual force of faith is extremely important because that is the substance in the realm of the Spirit that activates the Word of God to enable the angels to do what you just spoke. Fear, on the other hand, also enables angels, but not the ones you want enabled. So, sometimes you say, well, if I speak positively the Word of God, that enacts the Word of God. That's true. But if you speak the words of the devil, his angels are given authority by you. Because it, the Scripture doesn't just say, life is in your tongue. Death and life are in your tongue. But what about hope? Why should I have hope? 1 Corinthians 13.13 13 says, <clears throat> Now abide these three, faith, hope, and love. Of these three, the greatest is love. We know that without faith, it's impossible to please God. Hebrews 11.6 <clears throat> But think about this. Hope made it to the top three. It's a pretty big deal. Faith, hope, and love. Because you must have hope in order to get to faith. Without hope, you never reach faith. Because this is Scripture. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. And if you never have an intent expectation about what God's going to do, it will never get settled in your heart what He's already done. So when somebody says, well, I'm just hoping for... The... Hey, if you're hoping something that's in the Scripture, praise God, I stand with you. I'm hoping that will happen for you too. But if they continue to read that Scripture, hoping and believing that what God said He promised will be for them and delivered to them, then one day, that hope, they'll go, my goodness, you know, I've been believing all this time that God was going to heal me. I don't know what just happened, but I feel like He already has. I think, I think He's already healed me. And your friend may look at you and say, you don't look healed. And you may say, you know what? I don't even feel healed. But somehow in my heart, I know I am. I'm healed. Well, you sure don't look like it, but I am. <laughs> you see, and that's how faith grows and develops in your heart. Isn't that good? We need to know that angelic assistance is available for us. And, uh, wow, we have so much of this session we didn't get covered. But in the next one minute, I'm going to cover the next four pages. <laughs> you may have to read some of your syllabus <laughs> later. But we have some general facts about fallen angels, and we have some general facts about the angels of God. Keep in mind, they are still angels. We may call them unclean spirits. We may call them demonic spirits. But they are the angels of the devil are cast down to this earth. They are not all out running around right now. Some of them are committed into pits of darkness. We will take a look at that in the future. But we need to understand that God's angels operate in His kingdom. The devil's angels are still in the kingdom of darkness. We are children of light 
And our words are the entrance into the realm of the Spirit that activates the power of God and pulls the manifestation back into this realm. How is it you pray? You pray with words. What do your words do? Listen, when the Hebrews were in the wilderness, the Scripture says that their words, they went to their tents. They thought in their tents that they were safe to say whatever they want. Kind of like people who are at church, they think when they get to their car and close the door, they're safe. All the, all the rules and regulations for talking about the deacons and the pastors and everybody else at the church, all those rules go away. They don't exist anymore. Why? Because I'm in my metal tent. <laughs> well, the Scripture says that they all listened to Moses and probably all stood there and yes, sir, and, and smiled and gave respect to all the Levites and everybody was all happy and they went to their tents. Now it's okay. It's just, hey, look, I'm not saying anything bad. It's just you and me and they're all out there. And I don't mean anything bad about Moses at all. But did you notice the way he stood up there? Acting like he's some big, big hoop de doo guy. You know, just because he talked with God, just because his head glowed, he thinks he, you know. So <laughs> they went back to their tent. And the scripture says, while they were in their tent, that their words went up, entered into the realm of the Spirit. And their words went up before the throne of God. And God heard their words and He was angry. And you know the rest of the story. They didn't take an 11-day trip. It turned into a 40-year trip. So, where's the safe place to say evil things? There is none. Oh, praise God. Well, this will conclude... Session 3, of which we covered some of. But, you have the book, and you have the syllabus. We'll come back in about 10 minutes, and we'll start in on Session 4. God bless you.